Amer- uh, Ian McLaren has an interesting question, something I think about a lot. It says, America seems to be divided more each day between political ideologies. Do you see a second revolution civil war coming? Um, Boitra feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? I don't see a civil war coming. First of all, <laughs> now I'll just come out and say it. In the original civil war, you had a smaller country, the Confederacy, but these people were highly skilled. Most of them were outdoorsmen. These people were genuine fighters. They they wore rode horses. The Confederacy was a formidable military force, and the Union, needless to say, was also a formidable military force. You had two formidable military powers, one much larger with more resources, and the other, at least in the first half of the war, better led, better better trained, and with a much higher morale. So you would have a four-year war as the result of that. If there was a cultural war in America where one side has all the guns, all the guts, and all the belief, honestly, how long would this civil war last? Ten minutes? You know, every time I hear these... um, Every time I hear these uh, super leftists, you know, the anarcho kind of hipster leftists who are talking about, we're going to go take to the streets, man. We're going to take the streets. We're going to bring some violence on these people. These right-wingers are never going to know what hit them. The revolution starts in the streets now. I say, you people are afraid to open a jackknife. You know, guns make you scared. What are you going to do? you actually seriously talking about a revolution in the streets of America against conservatives? There are 300 million handguns and, and weapons in America something like that, 250, 300 million weapons in America, and virtually every single one of them is on our side. If these guys are actually serious about a, a class war and blood in the streets, most of us are not going to get a chance to reload. Um, the So a, a shooting war, I, I don't see it. I just don't see it. But something's got to give, right? I mean, something's got to give. This can't go on like this. Now, with that said, one thing we have to be careful of is we do have to be careful about how history works, about the mechanism of history, because history only shows you the highlights or the lowlights. It doesn't show you the day-to-day fabric of things. History is a telescope. It, things that took 10 years or 15 years of gradual stuff are seen in a very kind of a little paragraph entry, and then you know the Gilded Age or the Civil War and four years, and it's like you forget about all the details of every single day of four years, you know. It's thousands of days, 1,000, 1,200 days, whatever it is. So what I'm trying to get at here is while, while it may seem like the country has never been this divided and that it is so ideologically torn, let's not forget that during the Civil War, um, was it Charles Sumner? Sumner, I'm pretty sure his name, uh, a big abolitionist from, from Massachusetts, was beaten nearly to death by a guy from South Carolina. A guy took out his cane and beat him nearly to death on the floor of the Congress. You would often see on the floor of the Congress on the Senate, people would pull knives on each other, duels and stuff obviously being fought. Let's not lose perspective over how bad things are, because they are bad, but let's not lose perspective over how vitriolic it can be and has been in this country. And by the way, by weird coincidence, I was just fooling around on YouTube, and I watched uh, Helter Skelter, which is a movie. And I thought, I, I'm watching this. Man, I have. I remember seeing this when it came on in 1976. I have no memory of this being that good. Turns out it wasn't that good. I, I saw the remake. But when you look at the Manson thing, and you look at the hippies and the communes, and 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 all, they did a lot of editing of what was going on back in 69, 70. I was not old enough to appreciate that. In fact, I was overseas. I, I, I left New York in 63 when I was th- three, and I, I spent between the ages of four and 12 in Bermuda. I came back in 1970, 71, so I missed most of the 60s. I was too young for it mostly anyway. But honestly, guys, if you look at what was actually going on in the 60s, that must have just killed our, our parents, must have just killed them. To see the greatest generation have to watch all this stuff. When you think about how radical the 60s were and the riots and the hippies and all this other stuff, America's become far more conservative than that. We really have won a big victory. We owe a lot of that to Ronald Reagan. Um, so when we think about how you know, how, how um, polarized things are now, let's not forget just how bad things were even 30 or 40 years ago. Riots in the streets, you know, riots, and, and, and the whole country seemed to be falling apart. Ideologically, I think things are getting more extreme. I know from our side, I've seen, I've said this last last episode, that 
watching what they are doing to our country makes us so perpetually outraged, absolutely perpetually outraged, that I see in many cases we overreact to things that we really shouldn't overreact to. I understand it. I don't even really blame it, but we have to be careful. And I think we have to remember this, too. With the exception of the hardcore left, I'm not talking about I'm specifically excluding the Marxists and the and the hardcore progressives like the President of the United States and and Nancy Pelosi and Bill Ayers and and you know and and um, oh, what's his name uh, Rules for Radical guy um, Saul Alinsky all those guys those guys are genuinely evil they know exactly what they're doing they are trying to overthrow this country they hate it because of all the reasons we love it put those people aside that's five percent of the population. We have to remember that that our democratic countrymen are our countrymen, and they should be our friends. I don't blame most Obama supporters for supporting Obama to this day. I don't blame Obama. Obama is what he is. Obama's always been what he is. I blame the press. If there was an unbiased press in this country, the Democrats would be... A, 25 percent, 30 percent party. They'd never win another election ever. We have to understand that, you know, we we see Obama for what he is. And when you talk to people about what he really is, they either open their mouths in amazement or often, more often than not, they just put their fingers in their ears because they want to believe what they've been sold. Um, it's not their fault. It's not really their job to go and dig up all this stuff. Now, you could, uh, you know, I'll walk that back a little bit. It is their job. They're citizens in a republic. They have an obligation to do what the press isn't doing. But one of the things that's so pernicious and insidious, maybe I meant to say insidious, about about the press bias is not only do they just show Republicans in a bad light and Democrats in a good light, but it's much, much more subtle than this. The power of social proof and the and the media bias is simply this. If the press doesn't cover it, then people assume that it isn't news. And the great example of this is is still, to me, it's by far the most appalling thing that Barack Obama has done. And that is this business about selling out the missile defense shield to the Russians on TV. It's treason. Everybody knows it. It's treason. But the press didn't say it was treason. And because it wasn't news except from our friends, we all start thinking, well, it must just be me. Obviously, I'm just a reactionary. Obviously, I'm old school. Obviously, I'm all alone. Ob ob and and you, the social proof of the fact that no one else is calling it treason means, well, I guess it isn't treason. I guess it's just me. It's not just you. Of course it's treason. So this is what this is what's driving this divide is these people have to tell a lie. Hang on a second. Andrew Clavin, in the in the segment we shot today, had a profound, a profound thing to say. You know, every now and then he comes up with something. Uh, but my buddy Andrew Clavin had this to say. He said, the problem with liberals is they think of things like this. Liberals and progressives think of things in a little box. So if you put a poor person in a box and you throw some money into the box with the poor person, then on the other side out comes a non-poor person. Piece of cake. Excuse me. And what Clavin said was the problem with this with this theory is they forget that there is something else in the box, and what's in the box besides that is human nature. And this is why liberals cannot ever succeed because every solution they come up with ignores human nature. Uh, looking at the Aurora shooting, they want to concentrate on the guns because if you concentrate on the guns, you don't have to get to the root of the real problem. The real problem is human nature. There are bad and evil people out there. Now, this guy, who's never going to be named by me, is either crazy or he's evil. They're mutually exclusive, by the way. If you're evil, you can't be crazy. And if you're crazy, you can't be genuinely evil because evil is a sane choice for, for to do to do wrong. The reason the left wants to talk about the guns is because if they talk about the guns, they don't have to look at themselves. Taking away guns doesn't hurt them. They don't own guns. The reason they want to talk about the guns is because it doesn't hurt them. It's like them giving up ATVs or flying or closing airports. They don't fly. What do they care if you close an airport? When you get down to the heart of the matter and you find out that the failure is not the failure of the weapon, the failure is the failure of the human heart of that individual, 
then you get into very uncomfortable territory for the left because then you start dealing with people and you start dealing with the fundamental built-in flaw in human nature. And if people can go that wrong, then you will never be able to build this little paradise on earth where everybody behaves in everybody else's best interest. And even these people don't believe it. Like I said earlier, even Lenin lived like a king. They all live like kings. They don't share. They say they want everybody to share. They don't share. You know, Bain doesn't go out into the streets and become another worker. He runs the show. It's what Clavin said. The problem with all of these little fix-it models is inside the box is human nature. And they don't seem to be willing to deal with that. So how does that get us back to this whole Civil War, you know, thing? My friend Michael Walsh, good friend Michael Walsh, uh, who writes for NRO and, and New York Post, has been referring it to it as a cold civil war. I think that's exactly right. And I think it's going to stay a cold civil war. What's the end game here? There will be an end game. Liberalism is finished. I know people say that. Let me rephrase that because I've just walked into the kind of trap I try to protect other people from. I said once on one of these shows, we can never defeat progressivism, but progressivism can defeat conservatism. Because conservatism understands that as you build a society of wealth and prosperity and security, people will take it for granted because of that thing in the box, because of human nature. Because human nature is not to study the past. Human nature is to hope for the best. Human nature is not to prepare for the winter. Many, many, many more of us are grasshoppers than we are ants. Right? So human nature will always be there. And as long as there's prosperity, there will be people who will assume that prosperity is granted. It's just the natural state of things. As long as we have men and women willing to die for our freedoms overseas, people will always assume that we're the problem overseas. It's wrong, but it's always going to be that way. We have, a, we have an obligation to understand what it is about human nature, and that's really what it is about the political divide. We don't – We some of us see human nature for what it is, and some of us don't. And what I said earlier about liberalism being finished is liberalism is the, the theory that if you throw enough money at problems, the problem will be solved because they don't look at human nature. But we're out of money. Steve Green, my trifecta co-host, said if there's no more goodies to give away, what do you need Democrats for? He's absolutely right. So what's going to happen is this, I think. We are – not going to be able to sustain the path we're on. It's got nothing to do with whether or not we win the election or not. Everybody knows that the debt bomb is is catastrophic and growing. Everybody knows we're out of money. Everybody knows that if Barack Obama gets a second term, he's going to continue to print more money, and then there will be an economic collapse, not just in this country, all around the world, and no one – there be dragons. We saw what happened in the Great Depression, but let's not forget that during the Great Depression, most people were rural people. Most people could grow their own food. Most people were used to hardship. Much of America didn't have electricity. A lot of people didn't, you know, they had dirt floors in the in the, the 30s. This population is not going to be able to handle that kind of a collapse. So our only hope is to see what we can do to avoid the collapse. And, and that means what is America going to do? Is America going to continue down this path or is America going to change? A lot of times I get depressed and say there's no way to stop this. And then I realize, no, there are two signs of hope out there. There are two hopeful signs out on the horizon, and they're both states. One sign of hope is the state of Wisconsin. Because Wisconsin showed that America is not Greece and America is not France. Wisconsin showed that if you made the case that this kind of spending is unsustainable and cannot continue, then – you could even get 40 percent of union members to vote for, for, for change and hope, hope and change. Scott Walker succeeded in Wisconsin not because he had a great campaign but because he was, it was working. So Wisconsin gives us hope that this, that this debt bomb and this economic collapse caused by these liberal policies can be avoided. And the second thing that gives us hope is California because what every single thing that uh, Scott Walker did correctly in Wisconsin is being done – exactly opposite in California. California is the economic jewel of the union. Every single good idea that came out of the country used to come from California. Not every single one. But it was the golden state. It was the land of opportunity. It was where all of the aerospace was, all the agriculture, all of the entertainment, all of that stuff. It's all going away. They're going to spend 100 
billion dollars on a train that does 200 miles an hour to go from L.A. to San Francisco. You have to drive an hour to get to one end of the train, and then you have to probably take a five or six hour train trip with stops at half the speed of a jetliner. And meanwhile, 150 times a day or whatever the number is, people are flying. It's, it's an utter boon gal. Everybody knows it. That's all you need to know about California. It is, an, it is a bald-faced, clear-cut redistribution of $100 billion of my California taxpayer money into the hands of the union and construction groups. That's all there is to it. And it's going to fail. Now, the reason that California is hopeful for America is – this is not – when California fails, and it will fail, it's not going to be like the failure of Delaware, and it's not going to be like the failure of even Illinois. When the biggest economy in the union fails, used to be the fifth biggest economy in the world, it might still be. When that fails, Americans will have a choice. And I think I might have said this before. America, as a country, will have to choose. They'll have to choose between whether they want America to become California or whether they want America to become Texas. And I think that these two examples will be clear enough to wake up the American people. And I think the other example that will wake up the American people and avoid this civil war, cultural war, will be to watch Europe burn because it's going to burn. California may burn. If California goes bankrupt, the federal government will bail them out. There's nobody to bail out Europe. We've already bailed them out a trillion dollars, by the way, or more. But when they stop the benefits because there are no more benefits, they're going to burn. I think I, I swear I do believe it. I believe within a year or two we're going to see the Louvre on fire and we're going to see um, these Madrid on fire and Athens on fire and London on fire because of the rage of people who've never been able to take care of themselves, who've always been treated like, like uh, domestic animals. They're, that's what they are. They're a vote farm. They're a vote ranch. And when these people realize that they don't know how to take care of themselves or how to work for a living and when they have to come to the, to the choice that I had to face – that I told you about earlier. Do I want to stay here, sleep all day, and get government benefits and live on the, the, the generosity of my friends, or do I want to actually get up and do all this nastiness and ride a bike and get in at five and get out at midnight and become a human being again and an adult and a man and be responsible for my own welfare? Which one do I want to do? I don't know why I made the choice I made. I'm sure I made the choice I made because of my upbringing, which kind of ties up at the, the, the point that I dropped earlier. It is true that if the people in San Marino moved to Watts and the people in Watts moved to San Marino, in six months, San Marino would look like Watts and Watts would look like San Marino. It's got nothing to do with race. It's got nothing even to do with class or your benefits. It's got to do with your attitude. It's got to do with your attitude. And you can change attitudes. That's why we do what we do here. It's why we do the firewalls, trying to change attitudes. So... The last thing I'll say about the, uh, the the cold civil war is simply this. Another conversation I've had with Andrew and with several other people. I talked with Tammy Bruce in an event, and she was she says she does a lot of colleges, and she's amazed at how weak the liberal argument is, how easy it is to flip college students who've heard nothing but liberalism their entire lives. I told Andrew today, and I've said this probably to you guys a few times, I live in fear of going out there one day trying to defend these ideas and running into the liberal Goliath and this guy's going to dismantle me and take me to pieces and I'm going to look bad and I'm going to you know I'm going to I'm going to be embarrassed and, and I'm going to you know make the team look bad and and the longer I'm not, not that I don't stay prepared but the the more I do this the more I realize that doesn't exist the weakness of their attitude of their uh, of their arguments the weakness of what they believe is so astonishing that if we had a reasonably fair means of distributing information like a media They'd never win another election. It's why it all comes down to the media. Don't blame the Democrats. Don't blame the people who voted for Obama. And don't blame Obama. Obama is what he is. Blame the people who are supposed to present the information. The media is the enemy. They're the only enemy. If we had a fair media, there would be no Obama. There'd be no liberalism. Obama never would have been elected if there'd been a fair media. Obama would have been impeached if there was a fair media. That's the problem. So support PJTV if you can. Support Declaration Entertainment if you can. I know it's tough out there. But this is the hope, right? This is our hope. This is the one thing that we have that every single civilization that has failed in history did not have. 
Every civilization has rotted from the top down. Every civilization, civilization has failed because the elites lose confidence and take everybody down with them. It's been that way through all of the cycles of civilization, through the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, the French, the British, the Spanish, everybody. The only thing that's different about us is twofold. We have, number one, always in this country been a nation of rebels who have had a strong distrust of authority and government. That helps. But the main thing that may save us is the Internet. The Internet allows common people to talk to each other. The Internet allows me to talk to you, and looking off to the side, the Internet allows you to talk to me as we do on Facebook. This is how we encourage each other. This is how we support each other. This is how we realize we're not crazy. We're not alone. We're not the last people out there who believe this, right? This, I'm not saying this will save us, but it might. So stay positive, stay focused, and stay angry. Five people who wouldn't have voted otherwise get them to the polls and we will be out of the woods. Um, okay, moving